Richardson Theatre Center proudly presents Theatre of the Imagination, a series of music and audio vignettes presented in old-time radio style and featuring the finest of our North Texas community talent. This week we're featuring part two of Daphne du Maurier's classic haunting romantic thriller, Rebecca. But first a song, and once again, here's the incredible and incomparable Jennifer DeLucy. purple dusk of twilight time steals across the meadows of my heart high up in the sky the little stars climb always reminding me that we're apart you wander down the lane and fall me a song that will not die Love is now the stardust of yesterday The music of the years gone by Sometimes I want again with you when our love was new and each kiss an inspiration but that was long ago and now my consolation is in the stardust of a song Beside a garden wall When stars are bright You are in my arms The nightingale tells his fairy tale A paradise where roses bloom Though I dream in vain in my heart it will remain my stardust melody the memory of love voice. Thank you, Jennifer. Such a marvelous talent, that beautiful lady. And now it's time for this week's vignette, the chilling conclusion of Rebecca, brought to you by AEM Creations. What's your vision? At AEM Creations, our goal is to make your vision a reality. Whether it's a new or better website, custom trademark or logo, animations or graphics, 3D print, or even something as simple as a business card. AEM Creations employs state-of-the-art technology to build custom solutions for your project or business. AEM Creations is a Texas-based company, but our customers span the entire globe, and we work closely with all of our clients to ensure confidentiality and trademark copyright protection. For more information, give us a call at 214-649-0632 or visit our website at www.aem2create.com. That's 214-649-0632 or www.aem, the number two, c-r-e-a-t-e.com. Call today. Let us make your vision a reality.
The lonely British moors, the jagged Cornish coast, the cold and angry sea. All of these images combine to set the backdrop of our story. As a young woman, searching for love, discovers instead a terrible and long hidden secret. This is Daphne du Maurier's classic mystery, Rebecca. The fog was gone the next morning. The day dawned bright and glorious. Even the Cornish moors looked beautiful through my windows. I hurried downstairs, hoping to catch Max before he left, but once again, he had left early. Dear Frith had breakfast and hot coffee waiting, and I was genuinely surprised to see a stranger in the dining room as well. A short, well-dressed, but decidedly nondescript gentleman of about fifty. He stood and bowed politely as I entered. Good morning, madam. You must be the new Mrs. De Winter. I am. And you are? A Frank Crawley, my dear. I work for your husband. Oh, yes, his solicitor. Uh, my apologies, but I thought Max went to see you. Oh, not this morning. He's attending to some shipping business in Plymouth. He invited me to breakfast and said he would join me later. I, I do hope you don't mind the intrusion. No, not at all. I'm delighted to meet you, Mr. Crawley. Ah, uh, please, my dear, call me Frank. Mr. Crawley is for my clients, uh, none of whom are anywhere near as gracious or as lovely as yourself. You are very kind. How are you finding, Mantley? Still a bit overwhelming, I fear. I should think it will take quite some time to get used to. Overwhelming? Oh, yes, I believe that is the perfect word. Overwhelming, in so many respects. You've known Max a long time? Since he acquired the property, yes. It was originally his maternal grandfather's estate. Max was his only grandchild and subsequent heir. So you also knew his first wife? I did. I heard she was very beautiful. He seemed to grow somewhat anxious at that, almost as if struggling for words. Beauty? It's a relative term, Mrs. De Winter. Most believe it applies only to the physical. I don't agree. True beauty is within the soul, I should think. How one thinks, acts. <laughs> but then I'm a lawyer, of course, so I'm given to unorthodox views. No one seems to want to speak about her. Everyone seems, I don't know, reticent. Even Max. Yet there's so much I would like to know. He stared at me silently for a long moment, then his eyes swept cautiously towards both doors in the room. They slowly returned to rest warmly on my own. What would you like to know, my dear? How did she die? It was presumed that she drowned. Presumed? She went out for a sail one morning. Something she enjoyed doing alone. She never returned. Never returned? How do you mean? Her shoes washed up on the beach in the cove a few days later. That was the only trace. There, there was a search, of course, for days all along the coast. But nothing more was ever found. Oh, how terrible. Poor Max. He must have been devastated. Indeed. There was an inquest held a year later, as there was no further evidence to the contrary. She was declared legally dead. But I thought that sort of thing took years. Oh, it can. But Rebecca, uh, the first Mrs. De Winter had no real family to speak of, and it was obvious Max was, uh, well, what was the word you used? Uh, overwhelmed with grief. Even the court understood he needed to move on with his life. Mr. Crawley, do you think she could still be... alive? A strange look suddenly flashed across his face, something I couldn't quite define, and he quickly glanced away. No. No, I do not. If you'll excuse me, Mrs. De Winter, I must prepare some legal documents before Max returns. I have truly enjoyed your company and our conversation. And I yours, Frank. 
He smiled pleasantly and bowed, then quickly left the dining room. I felt oddly satisfied, as it seems I had made a genuine friend. Perhaps my first. There at Mandalay. Yet my elation was short-lived, as I happened to glance up towards the opposite doorway. Mrs. Danvers stood just outside, hands folded primly before her, and wearing her ubiquitous black. She had the appearance of a vulture, hovering over a dying prey, and the look in those dark eyes chilled my very blood. How long had she been there, or what had she overheard? I had no way of knowing, but it was obvious she wasn't pleased. Cold eyes held mine, seemingly against my will, and I could almost feel the outpouring of venomous hate. Then abruptly, she turned and disappeared. I stared at the empty doorway for what seemed an eternity, suddenly realizing my breath had quickened and my heart was virtually racing within my chest. I was, without question, genuinely terrified, but I couldn't imagine why. The weather turned cold, almost bitterly so, and dark. A fresh storm seemed to blow in from the bay almost every morning. Even within the warm and comfortable walls of Mandalay, I could hear the rumble of the sea, low and sullen, as if nature itself was angered. Or perhaps it was actually trying to warn me, warn me of a different storm that would soon be coming. While I heeded Max's request to stay away from the cove, I could not forget that filthy shack on the beach, nor could I forget the dark, lost look in his eyes, or the hatred in Mrs. Danvers. I actually saw very little of Mrs. Danvers over the next few days. It was as if she had made a point to avoid me, appearing only when she needed my intervention for some little servant dispute or another. And even when she only spoke in short clip sentences, tersely whispering, yes, madam, or no, madam, and then quickly disappearing to another part of the house, yet never before flashing another one of those vitriolic glares that shook my very soul. I knew I should have mentioned it to Max, but I knew he would only have said I was imagining things, and perhaps I was, and yet... One grey morning, both the sullen weather and sheer boredom finally overtook me. I decided to explore the entire house, top to bottom, to see its charms for myself. I wandered up long staircases along a narrow corridor for what seemed like hours, finally finding myself in the west wing, on the side that faced the sea, and stopped outside an oak-panelled door that was securely locked. Why I stopped there I had no idea, only that I almost felt compelled. I pulled a set of house keys, given to me reluctantly by Mrs. Danvers, only at Max's insistence from my skirt pocket, then slowly and patiently tried each one. The room I cautiously entered was large, musty, and forbiddingly dark. I fumbled briefly for the light switch. A single table lamp flickered on, but the dull light was enough to expose an elaborately furnished bedroom with a huge poster bed and eloquent tapestries that hung from ceiling to floor. The colors were subdued, yet pleasant, tasteful, and it was obvious it belonged to a woman. My eyes were suddenly drawn from the lush curtains to the wall above the fireplace and the huge, ornate portrait that hung there. It portrayed a dark-haired young woman, stunningly beautiful, wearing an exquisite gown and staring seemingly straight at the viewer, with, dare I say it, a thin, almost cruel smile, as if she were privy to some sort of dark secret that she was delighted not to share. She had mean eyes, like a lightning.
The beachcomber's disquieting words suddenly came rushing back, along with another baleful chill. I knew immediately who she was. What are you doing here? Oh, Mrs. Danvers, you startled me. Mrs. Danvers stood in the doorway with another malevolent glare. Her thin hands, no longer folded in front of her, were instead balled into fists at her sides. She visibly shook with rage. What are you doing here? For a brief moment, I was terrified. Then slowly, something within me summoned a courage I didn't know I possessed. I held her withering glare firmly, then pointed to the picture. That's her, isn't it? That's Rebecca. You do not belong here. This was her room. I am mistress of Manderley, Mrs. Danvers. You said as much yourself. I am free to visit any room I please. And Rebecca is dead. Mrs. Danvers suddenly rushed past me, practically running to the window where she threw open the curtains and pushed the lattice outwards. She turned back to glower at me. She isn't dead. She's out there, somewhere, and she'll return. I know it. He wanted her gone. Everybody wanted her gone, but not me. I loved her. She is mistress of Manderley, not you. You're the one who should be dead. If she can't be mistress, no one will. Stop it. Stop it. The woman threw herself at me like some crazed fiend, grabbing at my arms and dragging me towards the open window. I fought against her grasp, pushing and slapping with all the strength I could muster. But she seemed to possess an almost unearthly grip. We reached the window, and she pushed me outwards, her eyes flashing with demented fury. I felt a cold emptiness behind me, and suddenly realized... I was about to die. The grey darkness of the morning sky was suddenly lit by a bright flash, followed by the roar of an exploding rocket. Mrs. Danvers flinched and stumbled backwards, momentarily losing her grasp. I reached out and grabbed a porcelain vase from the table near the window and swung it as hard as I could at her head. She fell to the floor, unconscious, and it took me several anxious moments to slowly collect my wits. Ship aground! I turned to look out the window. The mist was thick, yet I could still see a small ship apparently run aground on a distant reef just beyond the cove. Other ships surrounded it and a distress rocket suddenly flared from one of them and hissed into the grey sky. A small group of men had gathered on the beach below the window. They watched the ensuing drama intently. Ahoy! Ship aground! As I watched, I saw another figure suddenly join them. It was Max. Jasper trotted happily with him. I threw a cautionary glance at Mrs. Danvers, who was still, gratefully, unconscious, and rushed out of the room. There were a dozen or so men huddled on the beach with Max, pointing and gesturing towards the distant shipwreck. I caught a smattering of anxious conversation as I approached. Who is she? Anyone know? Tis a German schooner, I think. She's hard aground, that's for sure. They've sent... A diver down from Kirith. It was then I heard Max's voice. A diver? Are you certain? Aye. They want to see if the reef broke her keel. Waste of bloody time. She's a goner. I saw Max suddenly pull away from the others. A strange, almost frightened look on his face. I called out to him quickly. Max, darling, it's me. He looked up at me then yet it was almost as if he didn't see me. I waved to him. Max, please, I must speak to you. I can't, darling, not now. I must see to something. But Max, it's terribly important. Mrs. Danvers... 
Max suddenly turned and ran towards the rocks in the direction of the cove. Jasper raced loyally after him. The two of them quickly disappeared into the mist. Max! I hurried back to Mandalay alone, anxious and uncertain as to what I would find waiting. I knew enough to leave Max to himself, though it troubled me as to why he ran. Why was he so frightened? And of what? I saw Frith standing at the terrace door, an anxious look on his face. Oh, Frith, I must tell you, Mrs. Danvers... Mrs. Danvers is gone, ma'am. Cook saw her running out the kitchen door in a terrible state. She was holding a bloody cloth to her head. Cook tried to ask what was wrong, but she kept running. Got into her car and sped away, Cook said. Like the very devil was chasing her. It wasn't the devil, Frith. She tried... Apologies, madam. Truly. But there's an urgent matter you need to attend. Mr. Crawley is here, along with a naval officer. They're trying to find the master, said it's very important. Have you seen him? A naval officer? Yes, madam. Something about a boat found in the bay. That cold, familiar chill suddenly swept through me again, as if the wind had pierced my very bones. Where is Mr. Crawley, Frith? In the master's study. Shall I announce you? No, I'll go and talk to him. Frank Crawley was in Max's study, along with a tall, ruddy-faced man wearing a blue naval uniform. Frank smiled at me as I entered, through the look on his face betrayed a tense anxiety. Mrs. Duhunter, how good to see you. Uh, this is Captain Searley of Her Majesty's Coast Guard. Gentlemen. How can I help you this morning? We need to find Mr. De Winter, my dear. Uh, the captain has some, uh, well, disturbing news. I believe I saw Max going on the beach earlier. He had Jasper with him, so he may be going for a stroll. I should think he'll return soon. May I ask as to the nature of this news? The two of them glanced at each other hesitantly. Then I saw Frank quickly nod. Captain Searley forced a polite smile. I'm afraid it isn't very pleasant, Mrs. De Winter. I understand. Do go on. One of our divers was inspecting that schooner that ran aground in the bay this morning. While he was down there, he came across something else. The hull of a little sailing boat. It had the name Rebecca painted on the side. Rebecca? Yes, ma'am. The cabin door was tightly closed, as well as the portholes. The diver broke one of the windows with his torch and peered inside. There were... skeletal remains inside. Dear God. It was ice that swept through me now, freezing and burning at the very same time. I could see those cold, evil eyes from Rebecca's portrait glaring into my soul and it almost seemed as if I could somehow hear her laughing. Now you see why we need to find Max, my dear. Of course. My God, how horrible. After all this time. If you know where we can find him, I... I'll go and fetch him myself. Shall I come with you? No. I need to do this myself. Surely you understand. Indeed, my dear. Uh, we'll wait here. I knew where to find Max. Without question, I knew exactly where he had gone, and I wasn't mistaken. I could see him standing inside the little boathouse as I approached. He had his back to the door, standing with his hands at his sides and his shoulders drooped, as if the weight of the very world was upon them. Jasper lay curled up on a filthy cot with his exquisite bed sheets. He wagged his tail in greeting as I cautiously stepped inside. Max? Dearest? They found her, didn't they? They found Rebecca. He spoke without turning around as if he'd been expecting me. How did you know that? As soon as I heard about the diver, I knew it was only a matter of time. Oh, God. 
I knew this day would come. I just knew it. I don't understand, Max. How did you know? He turned to face me, slowly. His face held a bitter, painful smile. We're not meant for happiness, you and I. I should have realized that before I forced you to marry me. Oh, you didn't force me, darling. I love you. Why would you say such a thing? Besides, why does it matter? They've merely found her body, that's all. Now the courts can actually close the books on her drowning. She didn't drown. What? Rebecca didn't drown. I killed her. I felt myself stumbling backwards, to the point of having to reach out to catch the doorframe before I could fall. He hadn't really said that, had he? Max, what did you say? I said I killed Rebecca. Right here, in this very boathouse. But how? Why? I strangled her. Because she was a witch. An unfaithful, lying, selfish, treacherous witch. But I thought you loved her. I did love her. But she didn't love me. She never loved me. She loved Mandalay, the wealth, the status, everything that came with it. I learned very soon after our marriage, there was no love in Rebecca's heart. This boathouse was her pillu, her love nest. She would come here with men she would meet at social gatherings, or God knows where else. I had no idea, of course. When I asked where she had been for so long, she would just say that she'd been sailing. She so loved to sail. How did you find out? Ben. I ran across him one day here on the beach. Poor old bugger told me the same thing he told you. He hadn't seen anything, he hadn't told anyone, didn't want to go to an asylum. So one day I followed her. I watched her come here from the rocks. Watched as a man I never saw before followed her inside. I waited until... until he'd left. Then I confronted her. What did she say? She laughed. She threw her head back and just laughed, as if it was the grandest joke she could ever play. She said I was nothing to her. Nothing. Just a source of wealth. She said she knew I would never divorce her because of the shame it would cause. Would you? I don't know. I never had reason to think about it. I never had time to think about it. She just kept laughing. And I lost control. I grabbed her by the throat and I started to shake her. I shook her hard. I didn't mean to kill her. I swear before God. I just couldn't stand the laughing. I couldn't stand the laughing. Max pressed his hands to his head, then suddenly fell to his knees on the sandy floor. I rushed to his side in spite of myself. My own husband had just confessed murder and yet I still loved him. And I knew I would always love him. It's all right, dearest. It's all right. I'm here. Why? Why would you have anything to do with me? I deserve to hang. Don't say that. Don't ever say that. I won't lose you, Max. Do you hear me? I won't lose you. But I killed her. Don't you understand? When I realized she was dead, I panicked. I put her body aboard her boat and then sank it in the bay. I didn't know what else to do. It was an accident, Max. That's all. Just an accident. But <laughs> I always knew she'd come back. I always knew she'd find a way to win. She hasn't won anything. Max, does anyone else know? Frank, Frith, any of the servants? I don't think so. I've never said anything to anyone else. I think Mrs. Danvers may have had her suspicions, but... Mrs. Danvers tried to kill me. What? I found Rebecca's room and went inside. Mrs. Danvers found me there and didn't like it. She said I wasn't the true mistress. And then she tried to push me out of the window. 
Good God, what did you do? I struck her over the head with a vase. I thought I might have killed her, but Frith told me she left in a panic. Good riddance. The woman was a bloody parasite. She worshipped the ground Rebecca walked on. I think she might have even known about her liaisons, but never said anything. Dearest, I have to go and tell them. No! Max, listen to me. You don't have to tell anyone anything. Confessing now won't help. Rebecca will still be dead. You'll be dead once they hang you, and... and I'll be alone. Don't you understand? I don't care about Manderley, the wealth, the status, none of it. I care about you, Max. Just you. But darling, I can't... Hush. Please, Max, for God's sakes, hush. I will never betray you, ever. We will grow old together, and both take the secret to our graves. You can love a man who killed. I can love a man who loves me. Quiet, please. Gentlemen of the jury, as this inquest is essentially a formality, I would ask if you have made any determination that there is any evidence that might challenge the original ruling. No, Your Honor. As the condition of the body was such to preclude an autopsy, there is no evidence or reason to conclude the victim died from anything other than drowning. We find that the death of Rebecca de Winter was, as already determined, simply a tragic accident. Thank you, gentlemen. Court stands adjourned. It was almost dark when we started back to Mandalay. Max held my hand in his as we drove. We didn't speak for a long time. In truth, there was nothing more to be said, and we both knew we would never speak of it again. I smiled at him and squeezed his hand gently. How are you feeling, dearest? I don't know. Relieved, I suppose. Darling, would you... Would I what, Max? Would you be terribly upset if we were to leave Mandalay? Leave? <laughs> and go where? Anywhere. France, Italy. Does it really matter? In all honesty, Max, I think I would be happier somewhere else. I think you would as well. As long as it isn't America. <laughs> Amen to that. My God, what's that? I followed Max's puzzled scowl. Ahead of us, just beyond the rolling hills of the moor, the evening sky was aglow with a bright orange light. <laughs> you mean the sunset? Can't be the sunset. We're heading east. Perhaps the northern lights? But then, that's only in the winter. The look on Max's face grew taut with genuine horror. He turned to look at me. It's not the northern lights. It's Mandalay. We crested the last hill and finally saw it. The whole of Mandalay was ablaze. The flames leapt into the night sky like evil, probing fingers consuming the entire mansion swiftly, hungrily. There would soon be nothing left but ashes. Max drew as close as he could, given the heat of the flames. That's when we saw Frith and the other servants huddled together near the path that led to the cove no doubt shielded by the wind that was blowing briskly from the sea, a wind that only served to fan the mansion fires higher. Jasper suddenly came bounding towards us when he saw us get out of the car. Master de Winter, here we are. Frith, thank God. Is everyone safe? Yes, sir. All accounted for. Frith, what's happened? It was... Mrs. Danvers, sir. What? Mrs. Danvers? Yes, sir. She came back to Mandalay this afternoon while you were gone. 
She was raving, sir, like a proper lunatic, screaming about murder and treachery and the like. None of it made sense, sir. We tried to calm her, but she was... Well, she was bloody well deranged, if you'll pardon me. Then what happened? She grabbed an oil lamp from the kitchen and ran upstairs and locked herself in. In where? Damn it, man, what happened? She locked herself in the first Mrs. De Winter's old room, sir. Next thing you knew, we smelled smoke, and the whole house was on fire. Where is she now, Frith? Mrs. Danvers, I mean. She never came out, madam. I'm truly sorry. Despite the incredible heat of the roaring flames, that insidious, freezing chill suddenly returned. If she can't be mistress, no one will! Good God. Max slowly put his arms around me and pulled me close. And we stood there together and watched, silently, as Mandalay burned to the ground. We can never go back to Mandalay again. The past is still too close to us. But sometimes, in my dreams, I go there again. I see the grey stone shining in the moonlight. Light comes from the windows. The curtains blow softly in the night air. And in the library, the door stands half open as if we had left it, with my handkerchief on the table besides the bowl of autumn roses and the charred embers of our log fire still smouldering against the morning. That's our show for this week. Join us again next time for another installment of RTC's Theater of the Imagination. Be sure to visit our Facebook and YouTube pages for previous episodes, and feel free to comment and especially like in support. And please, consider donating on our webpage, www.richardsontheatercenter, spelled T-H-E-A-T-R-E-C-E-N-T-R-E, dot -E 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 net. Help us keep community theater thriving. <laughs>